just one more. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Is, is everybody hearing the mic? No. 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 Okay, am I projecting my voice loud enough? Yes. yes. Your voice.
right? The reason why we kind of push you in the deep end of varsity in Lionville is because you don't get better until you lose, right? And you get so comfortable being novice, right? You're like, I won a novice tournament. I'm gonna go move on to JP. You kind of flex a little bit, right? It's like, yeah, JP. And then you get comfortable because like these varsity debaters are super scary. They don't feel how you see this in the rules and they're yelling water at me. That is what I felt as a debater because like I did not have a lot of confidence. I was terrified of public speaking and I always thought somebody knew more. One thing I want to clarify is like everyone in this room, including me, we all are pretending, right? We all thought on something for how we want people to perceive us, right? So when we're talking about like pushing you off in the deep end, be okay with losing, be prepared to lose. If you're like, I'm gonna lose this tournament, okay, good. Tell me what you lost on, who was the judge, why did you lose to that team, and tell me who you work on. We will not be angry, your coaches, right? Your lab leaders, your teachers, your coach, they will not be angry if you're asking them questions. We <laughs> when you That's don't do that, because then we get to teach you what you need to know, right? So wow. after three novice tournaments, you should be comfortable. That should be like three tournaments a semester, right? When you start the school year, September, there's a tournament, Right, and October, and then December. Three tournaments. Next year, for your freshman year, if you start off with one goal, right? Second year, second semester would be JV tournament. And then the following year, right, during camp, you go to an open lecture. If you start off early and you're only open to varsity lectures, do you see how much growth you could have more if you are in these more intensive classes? Then this kind of thing with the close evidence that in JV, you're more comfortable with that? Yeah? Right? I know that it is uncomfortable for you to kind of like not know, but it's okay in the setting. Okay? So that's really our model for Lingo. We deliberately put more people in varsity because there's only a few teams that go and travel naturally, so you'll be here that you're going to be one of the top teams. Because even if you hit like a top team, um, like you're going to be avoiding more. So, yeah, uh, everybody kind of understands like the transition rules. So if you can explain it to your novice debater, this would be very helpful. Three, three JV tournaments, and then if you win a division in your first tournament, you're allowed to say you have a really good debater. First tournament, you win novice. Next tournament, you're JV. That's what it is expected, and you shouldn't see that as unfair when you go to people, oh, well, actually, I'm not in the open. I'm only JV. You can handle open. Right? We are confident that you can handle open because whatever you think of here about these open debaters, I, I promise you, they are just like other JV debaters, just a little bit less.
45 minutes to an hour in between a prep. With an and then how long till it does it end? So it starts at like oh, 7 a.m. Yeah. You get to camp at 7 a.m. And then what time is like the walk around? Uh, usually around like 5 p.m. It depends on which day. Five, like sometimes, like really long to be around, right? So like, like Diego was saying, like Lambda tournaments are only Fridays and Saturdays, right? It's only like a half day on Friday and then <coughs> full day on Saturday. Was Lamb was Invitational from Seeds are, again, um, I guess we kind of go over the slides. Lambda schools can tend to compete against other schools. At Lambda tournaments, you only compete against people that are in your league, right? That's why we have closed evidence sets. So even if like a Bravo debater is debating someone from like um, ELC, they all have the same evidence set in novice, so you have that control, so nobody is like scared of debating, right? Um, but at invitationals, it's more like if you think of it as a national tournament, right? You have tournaments from you have kids from all over the country competing at certain tournaments because that's what they go and do, right? If you think of it like a basketball game, sometimes you travel to different cities, some schools do that. Um, the same thing goes for debate. And for Lambda tournaments, you only have four freedom rounds. What are freedom rounds? Can anybody explain? Rounds that everybody has. Four pre-elimination rounds. It doesn't mean that if you lose three that you don't get another one, right? Pre-elimination rounds just means that every debater gets that many rounds, and then after that, you move on to elimination rounds, which is double, which is like octofinals, semifinals, um, and finals, right? Uh, I think it's the quarterfinals, but that's what prelim means, and that's what elim means. So uh, my transition folks, if you hear people say like, oh, uh, I didn't get to elim, they just basically mean like, oh, I didn't make it to final, I didn't break to semifinal, I didn't break to quarterfinal. That's all it means. Um, so, uh, with invitational, there could be some fatigue because you do compete all day. It's like from 7 a.m. Saturday to like 8 p.m. Saturday, Sunday is the same schedule. And then on Monday is when you get the really competitive side where you have like three judges and then you're kind of debating on Monday, right? So you debate all day Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. And then on Monday, you have the elimination round. That's when you have like a panel of three people. Like if you have made it to the elimination round in Lando, right? You've seen that if we have enough judges, we usually have a panel of three people, right? Uh, the same thing goes for invitationals, and that usually happens on a Monday because that's when people like travel back, right? But that's kind of information for all of you if you've heard like other debaters say like, oh, are you going to this invitational or the Long Beach invitational or the Berkeley invitational? And you're like, what's the invitational? All that is, it's like a non lambda tournament that's like a bigger tournament hosted at another school or another university. So is everybody clear on that? Okay, um, several terms of your votes, you'll know that we have three main types of label judges, and I'll explain how we basically distribute the ballots and how we prioritize um, certain judges. So, um, we rely a lot on volunteers, and this is an emphasis that we have in lab, we have as a league, we are very volunteer oriented. I benefited, I benefited from Lindell, Joel benefited from a, an urban debate league from Atlanta, right? People that you see often, they come back here because they know that they benefited from a program similar to this, right? And none of these debates would be possible without volunteers, right? I know it kind of sounds like PDF, right? Because you know, donors like me, thank you. But like, without volunteers, these things actually will happen. It's actually really sad because sometimes, how many of you maybe have gotten a buy at turn? A buy? Sometimes those buys are religious control reasons. Sometimes they're like, we have an uneven number of teams. Sometimes we literally do not have enough judges. We need Jake one Capra, we need Gabriella in in um, the judging room, we need other people around. So when we don't have judges, we don't have debate, right? So when we encourage your parents to come and volunteer, that's what we need to make happen because we want to provide space for you. And if you are kind of like scared um, to have your parents um, go and judge, uh, they're not gonna judge around, I promise you. We love parents, they're also kind of scared. And we'll talk about like novice judges, but introducing the novice judges. These are judges that like all of our novices These sound just like a novice debater, right? So if maybe if you're a novice and you remember you'd have like college students volunteer. Sometimes you'll have parents, right? Sometimes you'll have like random professionals that are like bankers or they work in business that are like, oh, right, debate. I did like speech in high school, I want to volunteer. Those are the judges that we give novice debaters because everybody just needs to work on like improving themselves. They just work on public speaking. And generally the comments that these judges would make would be like, oh, you, you need to speak up or better, maybe you look at eye contact, but that's what novice debate judges have, right? We also have a lot of volunteers 
from um, like some colleges, like you'll wipe, like wipe, wipe. We have a lot of like CSUN debaters. Like raise your hand if you've been judged by like a CSUN, USC, or like Cal State Fullerton debater. Most of our like our, our uh, I'll get into that, but uh, Joel also sends some of the CSUN non debaters. Can you tell me like why that's not helpful, Joel? Yeah. So yeah, every yeah. So every class I have basically is like really hard. And so I like I make it hard on purpose. Part of the reason is because then people need extra credit. And so to get extra credit to pass classes, often they will come here and judge debates. So technically, it's kind of like free labor. <laughs> <laughs> they're like producing, you know what I mean? But from their perspective, they're like happy for the opportunity uh, and really, really excited. Um, so yeah, I mean it's, it's like it's like really 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 important. So yeah, just for some context, like a lot of people are not in our debate classes at all. I had people who come to judge. I taught at a class in like statistics in graduate school, so they're like people who are professionals who have like literally never seen like a debate or anything, and they're just coming here. So imagine how terrified they are <laughs> of like judging a debate with even fifteen year olds who have at least read the packet. So, like, the reason why we also put these inexperienced judges in not doing programs is because everybody doesn't know what they're doing, so, like, it's good to have some feedback. But also, when we get to JV, uh, again, raise your hand if you are transitioning JV to varsity. Transitioning JV to varsity. Okay, uh, can, anybody get any, can anybody give me insight on, like, the types of judges that you've had? Are they mostly, like, volunteers that you don't know? Or are they, like, sometimes coaches from other schools? Are they? They're mostly mm, coaches, no. right? Coaches and maybe some alumni, right? So in JV, by the time you move up to JV, we expect that you kind of know policy debate, you know the arguments, and we give you varying levels of experience. Sometimes you'll have a varsity debater judging, sometimes you'll have a college debater judging a JV round, but here's when you start getting more experienced judges, right? People that have already kind of know debate, maybe aren't experts on it, right? But coach it, that's when we give you, like, that's what we give JV. So JV people won't necessarily always have um, inexperienced judges, but even if you do, that's okay because even in JV you're still learning. Varsity. Varsity judges, I don't think you've ever given a varsity round, uh, I don't think you've ever given a judge a varsity ballot because we're being, not because we're scared of y'all, but we're scared that you will scare the judges. So we never give out varsity ballots to inexperienced judges. This is when you get a lot uh, more of the volunteers that we always see. Like, I don't know if in P So you can get, um, uh, so varsity can get their arguments and packets that they want to run 
So uh, people have, uh, so they get sources from uh, words and practice, right? Good. But why do you think it was created in the first place? Because as Joseph said, like the documents are the foundation of debate. Documents are foundation of debate, right? Okay. And then? Uh, it makes things more fair because you can't argue that to folks who didn't disclose if they write an article with the party. Okay, okay. So with that, we're talking about like disclosure in the wiki, right? But before we talk about the normal, the normal practices of debate, I want y'all to understand how debate was before there was a normal practice of disclosing, uh, disclosing arguments. So I think Bill can kind of in, like, introduce the part of like what the wiki looked like before we started debating on laptops. Yeah, it's just made me feel real old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's all right, though. Okay, like I used to debate, like I started debating my Urban Debate League. Um, and so my introduction was like kind of similar to yours. Like you get like a, a summer packet. I didn't go to summer camp, but I got like a packet of, of UDL arguments. Um, and then I went to like an invitation tournament and nobody was reading the stuff I was reading. And we just kept taking L's and L's and L's. And there was like no climbing out because even though I thought at least I was smarter than some of those kids, like I didn't have cards. And there was nowhere to get cards. Like if you wanted cards, either you had to produce them or somebody had to give them to you. But the schools that had them and were winning were trying to give them to me. And there wasn't really a norm or community where like you shared evidence at all. Like there was no wiki where you just put your cards up there. If you wanted scouting information on a team, you had to have scouted them themselves or ask somebody else who did that scouting. That's really, that worked for all the schools that were like private schools, you know, like like the schools that you see at Invitationals that are like consistently winning, their coaches know each other. But for people who are like from Urban Debate Leagues and don't honestly know anybody or have any access, you, there was a cap on how good you could be, basically. It was like if you had cards, you could win. If you did not have cards, there was just like no possibility. Now, as you debated longer, you could go to debate camp. In debate camp, if you went to the UDL camp, well, you still were going to have the same situation. If you went to like another camp, those are super expensive, and those camps had exclusive evidence, basically. Like the, they had co coaches who would like produce that evidence, teach you how to have that evidence. And really, the reason to go to debate camp back then was not because you wanted to learn how to debate; it was because you wanted the evidence, basically. Um, and now that's not true anymore because we kind of, as a community, decided like that's really wrong, you know, that certain kids cannot participate fully in the activity just because they don't have like the money to buy cards that everybody else has. And so on it, all the camps put their evidence online for free and basically circulated around. And they started doing things like the wiki where you make an argument, we put it up, at least you put up enough information that somebody can go get that evidence so you don't have to start from scratch. So it's like really a manifestation of the community that we have, that it's not just Lambda, but also Lambda is a part of a bigger, broader community. So you also participate in that community by putting your stuff on the wiki. Yeah. Exactly, right? Like the wiki came to be because it like people thought it was really messed up that some schools could afford to pay to go to camps, to fancy camps that were like maybe six weeks, maybe longer, that you stay overnight and you get to work with college professionals every single day, nine to five, just producing files. Imagine the kind of workload, right, that you would have if you had those resources. And what kind of resources you wouldn't have if you didn't have kind of open evidence, right? It's very elitist and it's very um, like, I, like lack 
He has all of the schools across the country that compete with healthy weight, right? This is also where Lambda Bar City debaters are expected to upload their wikis and their sites. So when JPO emails their coaches and your coaches bother you, the team captains, to tell the rest of the team, hey, upload your sites to the wiki, this is what they mean by uploading their sites, right? I just want to show especially the transitioning people and even some Bar City people who don't know how to upload or what the wiki is, this is what it is. So let's kind of like say that you are transitioning Varsity debater, you want to find open evidence. You want to find, okay, I want to know, let's say it's last year's topic on our I'm going to, I keep losing to this raw wiki. I'm going to say raw wiki, not raw wiki. So last, let's go. Bravo, there. Is that bravo? Yeah. Okay, cool. Click on it. I found bravo. There. So this is from last year. Let's just go, first one. That Delgado Flores app. Okay. Click that. Okay, what are they running? What have they run? I'm looking through here. These are all their cases, right? You'll see here that these are examples of the tournaments and the rounds that they had and just uh, whether or not it was like uploaded. But here is where you would find some of the evidence. This is where you see check their wiki. If you've heard the term like, oh, check the team's wiki, this is what we mean by checking the team's wiki, right? <coughs> Go through here, it's like, what's their app? Uh, their app is like, okay, right. Here are the arguments. Their inherency argument is this, and here's the sites. Their next argument is this, and here's the sites. The reason why this is super useful and why you should be doing this with other teams that either that you compete against that you keep hitting is so you already know what arguments they're going uh, that you need to prepare for, right? So if it's the same app that they're running, instead of going to the round and setting up the email chain, you're like, oh, what app are you running? If you pull this up beforehand and you're like, hey, are you running this human trafficking app? And they say, yeah, it's like, cool. That's all you need and you can look through without having to wait for them to email you. That's why this is faster and more efficient. I know it's a good way for you to start practicing looking up other people's arguments online because you could get, you could like get stuck into a loophole if you're really into debate and just kind of look at different cards that people have. Uh, but this is what it means to like look over sites and look over specific arguments that you need. This is what it means to disclose your arguments, right? This is disclosed for practice, right? Um, so if you ever had an email service post that said you need to disclose your case, you need to disclose your knife arguments, you need to disclose this, this is what disclosure means. You need to upload your site on this website so when any other Lambda school goes and looks you up, they can look up, oh, hey, this team from ELC uh, Mama, ELC VABA, right? They run this thing, I already know what they're running. This is so we all know what we are running in varsity Lambda tournaments. Because if JD and not are already closed, we need to have some sort of check to make sure that people aren't deliberately trying to hide evidence just because you want to. I think that's the worst form of being one of my pet peeves is people deliberately trying to withhold evidence because they think they have the upper hand. I don't want to let you see how good my evidence is because I want to win the debate and I want to be the best. That's really not how you foster community. That's not how you foster debate community. If you want to win, then debate your best evidence. If, they are, if you are worried, that people will beat you because of your evidence, that means you're not improving enough as a debater because you're solely relying on hiding evidence, right? Think about this like how, how we expect uh, we, how we expect transparency from our politicians, right? You, we kind of want transparency in debate. So if you are a great debater, people can have all your files because you know you have the skill to maneuver whatever evidence it is and understand it in that context and not rely on just like shady practices like not sending out the doc or not sending out certain evidence, right? So that's what I kind of want to set as a norm and what we want to be clear on. Um, can everybody see the quick lens right here? Yeah? Yeah. The links right here? Yeah. Is this the LD one? Is that not it? Hold yeah. up. Just one more. This one? Yeah. Okay, if you click on this link, this takes you to another wiki page. This is the Lincoln Douglas wiki page. The type of debate that we do is policy debate, but at this point, uh, you can also look at the LD wiki page, the link to Deborah's part, because it's essentially like policy debate, but where a lot of um, uh, more research, uh, more resource schools have evidence, right? So let's kind of click on this and see where it takes us. LD, right? Same practice, but this type of debate is one-on-one. -on -one. And since this link and Deborah's debate, the topic changes every two months, so they they turn out way more files than they turn out way more files than um, policy. Right, so I'm gonna look up our website because they did I spell it wrong?
change the energy once. The reason why I'm showing this is because in yellow here, they have a lot of moves, right? I'm going to play on Andrew's off. That's out. That's because they're out. Since their topic changes every two months, they've literally had similar or the same topic last year for two months, right? So if you look here, right? It says. Yeah, 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 you're right there. Where is Saudi Arabia? Uh, just the Yemen one. Oh, yeah, okay. Yemen part, right? So when you have, like, sometimes they'll have a lot of different files for different topics that you could use at your disposal. And this is an example of what's called open evidence, right? If you saw it at the other site, it was just the tagline and it was the site, and it was usually either the first sentence and the last sentence of the paragraph, right? But here, if you see, it's a whole card, and if you keep scrolling through, it's just more of the card, it's just unhighlighted, right? That's what's called open evidence. So the idea is that you would copy and paste, like, hey, I kind of like this argument, I want to read more about it, I'm going to copy and paste it so I can highlight it myself, and I can also click on this link and read more about it and cut more parts if I wanted to. That is the whole point of the wiki, so you can do this, right? If you steal part, right, stealing part is like taking part, Right? Like sometimes we don't have resources to do that, but it's up to you to go do research and read it and re-highlight it, right? Not just like, oh, I'm gonna get this argument out of context and use it in my part. The whole point of this is so you have access and um, access to do this on your own at home, even without a coach, right? So if you want to use an example of this, please please use this to your disposal. Look at other topics that they've had because they've definitely had affirmative on arm sales in the LD topic. It might be a little bit smaller, but it'll give you a lot more arguments and a lot more files to work with um, like when you're in work. Okay, so um, is everybody kind of clear on how the wiki works? Here uh, on this column, you can see where you can find the actual document that was in the round, so we kind of click on that. It's like, I want to see, I want to see this document. Open it. Right now, all I'm going to demonstrate is how to look 
aggressors, let's say that you have um, a judge from LMU judging you and you want to look up their judging philosophy, right? People that are in debate, that judge other varsity debates, they have what's called a judging philosophy, right? Or a judging paradigm, or a, yeah. So if you hear any of those terms, that just basically means what judges look for. So usually if you look here, yeah. if you go to paradigm on tabro.com right here, is where you'll look up specific people, right? So if you look up here, Devin, let's say I want to look up Devin Paradigm. He's right here. Sometimes if you don't automatically see it right here and he ends up someone's name wrong, um, you can look up on Google, like,
you want to argue that you dropped it, I'm going to be like, okay, where? Why? Why does it matter? Right? So that's what I'm super picky about. I do not actually look at evidence until you call it out because what debaters tend to do when they're on their laptop, right, because I was still in that generation transitioning from paper debate to like laptop to me where we're starting to send out um, files. Um, what y'all tend to do and like what other debaters tend to do is they read a lot of files because you think a lot of cards are really more arguments, right? But it doesn't actually mean, it doesn't actually translate to judges. All, they, all they're doing is like listening to the arguments, writing them down and tagline, but if you solely rely on the authors, I promise you like 90% of your uh, of your judges will not get the author, they'll get the arguments because that's what matters the most, right? So I heavily emphasize that because uh, what else? Do I kind of, I'm picky about Hey, uh, we'll talk about this more like the, I guess we're kind of running short on time. Um, we talk more about this about like the four specific types of apps that Bill mentioned in this pop-up lecture, but I'm very interested about K apps, right? So uh, I guess uh, my question is thinking about K apps is that they need to follow this general structure, right? If you are looking at a judge, right, not just me, but any type of judge that have very specific instances of like what they want, it usually means that they keep voting down teams, they keep getting preferred or hearing certain types of arguments that that annoys them that they, they don't want to keep hearing, right? So if I keep hearing generic AI, I keep I keep hearing the same bad arguments. I usually put it up here so the students know it's like, hey, here are the things that you need to do to win my vote. Or what I look for for a right? Judges will usually be more explicit or maybe not as explicit in their paradigm. That's why it's really important for you to look through it to know what they emphasize as important. Because if you don't know that, and you're like, oh, she wants a Cal State Fullerton, they're very like critical, they, they like k right? She's gonna vote for a chaos, right? That is not usually what happens. There's more specific reasons about like why people, because the way they do, so please just make sure that you're always looking at um, judge philosophies. Um, I guess it's too long. Does everybody know how to look up your judge now? Yeah. yeah. And again, uh, what's the best time to start developing your strategy? 
Kentucky. Uh, you should be talking about it now and to study your address. Running out of time, so let's kind of get through these last four slides um, about specific, the specific types of affirmatives that you'll have. Um, so first is uh, the topic has four different affirmatives. First is broad text, specific country. Specific tech, broad country, specific tech, specific country. Broad tech, broad country, right? Uh, this is the same with the one language that y'all had in public lecture. So if you want to put an A, B, or C, or D, don't worry about writing out, down all the information right now because you'll have your class. Um, okay, so broad tech, specific country. Uh, this reduces a broad range of arms sales to specific country. This is your Taiwan app, right? So for example, it limits the specific type of weapons that we ban from Taiwan. This is like an arms embargo. Um, and again, the best advantage based in literature is the geopolitics. It's about geopolitics and not military technology. Can anybody tell me like what geopolitics means? Anybody know? Might be another buzzword, but if you think about geopolitics, think of it as like international relations, right? So it's more so about how countries uh, raise or reduce tensions with other countries. So a lot of the literature about Taiwan will be how we interact with Taiwan, right? Like how the US, um, how their interaction and their, uh, and their tension with Taiwan will increase or decrease. And it talks about more about like the diplomacy of things and not like the specific tax, right? So um, that's one of the main, um, that's one of the aspects of that. Next one. Can anybody else tell me like what other implications? 
Korea and North Korea, and the purpose of that is to prevent them from attacking. What are uh, some other negative implications of having those landmines there in the first place? Helene? Uh, North Korean civilians can't escape the, the dictatorship. Yeah, so an impact of that could be like, yeah, it, yeah, it could stop North Koreans from attacking, right? But it could also prevent some North Koreans from escaping and, put it, and have it be potentially dangerous. And that's when you start to get to weight arguments about whether or not landmines does more harm to get, right? So I'll get to the last slide, you know, three more minutes left. Um, broad pack, broad country. This is where we would label pay app. Any critical app, which I see a lot in Landle, which is basically making a broad moral claim and with any broad country, right? So it usually talks about a broad range of arms sales across a range of countries. And the best literature is about critical geopolitics. When we talk about critical geopolitics, we're talking about the type of criticism that you've heard in like Albert's lecture. For example, the CAP pay, settler colonialism pay, anti-blackness pay, right? It's all about talking about the structure between countries and the geopolitics, right? The international relations and what's wrong with the topic in the first place. So um, here, it'll say arms sales are a tool of the American um, imperialism. What that means is like, are we starting with a point of reducing arms sales, or are we starting at a point of peers criticizing the revolution? Are we starting with arms sales or with the revolution? With the attack on arms? Does this say? It's okay. With broad pack, broad country, right? You're always starting from the point of, of the revolution about why it's bad, right? If you think about this, these are all K apps, and A, B, and C are all types of plants. Um, there are going to be. Um, I guess we're wrapping up this lecture. There's all being a basement. Um, please read it over your case. There are going to be more slides about responding to the specific types of um, cases that you can go over in the lab. Uh, but with that said, um, yeah, I'll be here if you have any other questions. But with that said, have a good lunch. Maybe leaders on your